It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to episode 347 of Science on Top. Today is Monday, the 25th of November, 2019. I'm Ed Brown and I'm joined by Penny Dumsday. Hello. And Lucas Randall. Hello. And don't forget, we're coming up to the end of the year and we want to know the stories that you liked most this year. Let us know and if we like them too, we might talk about them on our last show. So if you go to scienceontop.com slash contact, you'll find all the ways to get in touch with us through the contact form or social media. And you can even click the voice message button and leave us a recorded message. Just let us know if there was a favourite story that we talked about or even stories that we didn't cover this year. And uh, yeah, we'll have a look. And while you're on our brand new and improved website, why not click the donate button and become a Patreon subscriber? What have you got to lose apart from your money and your dignity? So... Let's begin and... Well, I didn't know that was... Uh, <laughs> yeah, I didn't know people no, that's could, an option. I didn't know that's people could pay with their dignity. Uh, that, like, you just, just, honestly, I've got no idea how that really works. I just... It occurred to me <laughs> that uh, some people may feel a loss of dignity by subscribing. Let us know at the contact form or leave a message if you've lost your dignity by subscribing. <sighs> this got derailed very early on. But let's begin with a really exciting uh, medical news. For the first time, doctors at the University of Maryland School of Medicine have purposefully put at least one human patient in suspended animation. Now, Penny, before you explain to us exactly what they mean by suspended animation, it strikes me that it's a little bit like talking to the dead. Anyone can do it. The hard part is getting them to reply. So have any of these patients been reanimated? Now, we don't know yet. Right. The results of this trial won't be really published until 2020, but it seems like perhaps they have, which is... They're obviously the confident news. enough to be talking They're about confident it. enough to do it. So what this means is if someone presents at the hospital with like a severely traumatic injury, like for example, you know, a knife wound or gunshot wound or something, and they've gone into, they've lost a lot of blood, they've gone into um, cardiac arrest... Um, they've lost, their heart stopped beating, then there's only minutes available to operate basically, to fix it all up before the patient passes and the chance that they'll survive is less than 5%. So this is for, you know, a very traumatic wound with lo loss of, lots of blood loss. Mm. So these are people that come into the hospital and they're probably going to die. However... What this idea of suspended animation is, is basically giving the surgical team longer to operate. So what is involved is just, to me, out of science fiction. Um, so at our normal body temperature, which is about 37, we need a lot of oxygen to, um, to supply to our cells and so on. But obviously when our heart stops beating, that supply is over. If you lower the body temperature, the brain and the body and the chemical reactions or our metabolism in our cells slows down, so you need less oxygen. So the way that it's done is by essentially replacing the blood, which wasn't which has been lost anyway, with a saline fluid, an ice cold saline fluid, which cools the patient down to about 10 to 15 degrees, so really cold. Um, considering we ma maintain this constant body temperature of almost 40 degrees. Um, and essentially their brain activity almost completely stops and they're basically, they would otherwise be considered dead. Um, but then they have about two hours to operate instead of minutes before the person is warmed up and their heart is restarted and then they see how successful that was. So... 
This it's it is huge. massive. It's, it's, so this idea, like you know, I mean, it happened in. Oh, did it happen in Star Wars with Han Solo? You know, this idea of cryogenics or <laughs> freezing yeah. people to you know come back to life is not new, but to actually do it and to do it for yeah. a couple of hours in order to perform you know more delicate surgery or you know better surgery than you might otherwise do to potentially save someone's life is really cool. It's also a fascinating Absolutely. trial. Um, so it's been approved, even though for obvious reasons, the patients that are involved cannot consent. Um, they're mm. patients that would base, would otherwise be, um, brown bread. Well, they're probably going to die anyway, um, sadly. And in the community of the hospital, they have put out press releases and publicity about it. So people can choose to opt out of the trial if they don't want to be involved. But the, the way that patients are selected is, you know, if you come in with the right kind of injury and the right kind of situation and the surgical team required all happens to be there, then you're one of the 10. If you come in with that in injury and so on, but the surgical team needed to do this procedure is not there, then you're not eligible. So there's luck, luck of the draw, draw very nice, much yeah. so. Um, it's an interesting way of doing a control, isn't it? It's like, it, yeah, we're controlling because all of you could have been there, <laughs> but we weren't there, so you're not there. So therefore, you're our control. <laughs> and it, uh, it we apologise for not not being alive anymore. That's uh, that's a bummer. But uh, it's hard though it's because you. I mean, how could you do a normal control and choose people? Mm. Oh, for huge this? Eth ethical problems. Like, yeah, yeah. Y yeah. So I mean, you like, can't expect people. But to I'm be even confused. Hours a day. Yeah. Of course not. And their chances of being able to do it if they've been awake for 16 yeah. hours or whatever are immediately reduced so, anyway. I'm even curious as to how people opt out. There's apparently a like, website. You, I assume you put website. your name on a register. Yeah, a and fill out a form register. in case you think you're going to die anytime soon and you don't want to participate. So they did um, like press releases more... and articles. So you'd have to make sure you've got ID on <laughs> you when so. you get shot. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I'm imagine like imagine if strong, yeah. like oh you know for religious reasons or they just like mm. you know mm. they know mm. that that's something that they wouldn't be comfortable with. They can say no, but yeah. But some people just hate being old. Th like I, it's, <laughs> even for <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> even for a short period of time, it's uh, it's too much. I think. The, the ethical question is simply, well, it's answered that they have done their best uh, efforts to meet their obligations mm. from an ethical point of view. They've notified people as best they can. They've made a system that they can uh, withhold the treatment if uh, someone doesn't want it. But at the same time, it's the sort of thing where they're doing it under their best uh, interests. Mm. They're trying to help the people. They're people who have a very poor prognosis otherwise anyway exactly and and i mean also i was just going to mention the animal studies and i think we've talked about this in the past i'm not sure but that i that um pigs have been called for three hours stitch up and resuscitated so pigs and humans not so different even though not the same so it's um it's really interesting and i feel like this could open up not even just for patients with trauma but i mean in you know, as the technology advances, who knows if this might just, yeah, who knows what will happen to surgical techniques with this because I think having more time, reducing the, you know, the amount of stress to the body being open like that. Um, uh, it'll significantly increase your chances of survival. It's, it's, it's a, fascinating. I'm really excited yeah. to see because I'm sure there's some, um, study will be published and it's hopefully by the end of next year 2020 so yeah i can't wait to see they really have to publish it now don't well they? yeah it's like a, it's like a teaser like it's it's like you know the latest star wars is coming um uh, they they'd also uh, did you mention penny but that they'd had uh, success with this technique with um pigs yes that they'd yeah. had um yeah you yep. did yeah yeah so uh, i like that as well it's a case of yeah it's time it's time we need to try to try on some humans now we keep doing the pigs the pigs, uh, I think up to two hours, they had the pigs in this uh, state um, and uh, it's time. Imagine being there going, okay, tonight's the night and just sitting there waiting for someone who's <laughs> yeah, to come had in. a traumatic event. You know what I mean? Like 
<laughs> Come on. This is Baltimore. Someone's got to shoot someone sometime. Come on. It would seem a little bit, um, yeah, a, a little bit ghoulish. Macabre. Yeah, but uh, yeah. still, it, it's very cool. Yes. Uh, it, an extraordinary uh, success if they can, as I say, reanimate patients mm. afterwards. And, well, they say they've done it to at least one. Yeah, patient. but they, they haven't discussed so, the success of that. Yet. Yeah. I don't, I don't know if I'd be talking the trial up if that was a failure the oh, first time knows? around. But yeah. You kind of are obligated to either way, I guess. All right. Well, Lucas, this week was a, actually a really good week for planetary science news. First of all, the first geomorphologic map of Saturn's moon Titan was released. How cool was that? It was really cool. It was from Cassini uh, data and showed flat plains, sand dunes, hilly terrain, lakes full of liquid methane. It really revealed just how Titan's geology and atmosphere are similar to Earth's mm. in a lot of ways. Mm. I, was watch- I was on the plane the other day. I was watching um, uh, a new Brian Cox, or I don't know how new it is, relatively new Brian Cox uh, show called The Planets. It's one of the BBC, you know, uh, ones that he does. Um, fascinating, fascinating series. I only got to see two episodes on the plane, so I'm looking forward to another plane trip so I can see more of it. But um, they they did, uh, there was a, the first episode was basically talking about the, the, you know, the moment in the sun. It was talking about when each of the, uh, each of Venus, Earth and Mars have had their moment in the sun where they've had liquid oxygen, uh, liquid, uh, liquid uh, water, I should say, on the, on the surfaces. They've had the right conditions for that. Um, and, and it extends out to, and later on after, after our star goes into its red giant phase later in its life, um, Titan will eventually um, have its moment in the, in the sun where it will be able to, very likely, will be able to sustain liquid water on its surface. And there's a huge amount of water there because there's all these basically ice mountains of liquid water, or sorry, of ice water, I should say, um, that will eventually melt. And then uh, its atmosphere of, of uh, basically hydrogen and helium uh, and methane, and so, sorry, hydrogen and methane, will will just become atmospheric. So, so cool. So one day, yeah. what we're seeing now is basically, you know, a, a map of what, what, what t- Titan will look like when it has its moment of being, uh, of, of having water on its surface and an atmosphere. <laughs> so that just gives me chills. It's awesome. <laughs> chills. <laughs> uh, Unintentional. Because we're talking <laughs> ice. Yes. <laughs> No, it's really, really cool um, and just exciting, as I said, to see the similarities. Obviously, mm. a lot of the time they're talking liquid methane uh, oceans or lakes are there, but very similar to uh, Earth's liquid water lakes. Yes. Uh, but there were, t- there were two other discoveries that happened this week that I know you want to talk about. The Curiosity rover found some unexpected oxygen on Mars and astronomers have detected plumes of water vapour on Jupiter's moon Europa. Mm. Tell us about these. Okay. Uh, I love Curiosity. I, I really, it's just, it's like that, that real yep. plucky little rover sort of thing. Not so little, it's freaking huge. But um, uh, it, it's a science lab, right? It was, it's, it's, um, it was known mm-hmm. as the Mars Science Laboratory, MSL. So it, it, it actually has this suite of instruments that it's able to deploy. And although it spent its life in Gale Crater, um, just just exploring one one piece of real estate on on Ju- on uh, I was going to say on Jupiter on um, on Mars. Uh, it, it's you know the science that it has done in the time it's there has been extraordinary, and the fact that it still keeps on kicking on. It's got you know it's got damaged wheels and bits that aren't working quite properly anymore and whatever. But just like its other brethren over there, the other rovers, they've just had extraordinary success with the rover missions mm-hmm. on Mars. Um, not the Russians though, and not the British. Let's not talk about them. But um, but certainly the NASA JPL missions have been uh, fantastic with the, with their rovers. So this latest one, uh, this is actually utilising um, some data that's been collected over a period of time that it's taken quite some time for them to to analyse and basically um, ensure that that. That this wasn't actually just a misdetection, and what they've what they've found is that there are, uh, for want of a better word, plumes of oxygen uh, that uh, Curiosity have has detected on Mars, which are not easily explained away. So 
we've talked before about detections of methane on Mars, which also are a little bit outside of the ordinary. And, and, the, and the, the, I guess the exciting thing is about both methane and oxygen. I'm using my hands here to put them in front of me. You can't see that. Um, <laughs> uh, both both methane and oxygen are things you would look for if you were trying to find uh, life on distant planets, right? So if we're looking at uh, you know, a distant planet trying to ascertain whether it uh, is a good candidate to investigate further. These are two things you would look for. You would look at for uh, methane because uh, one of the best ways of producing methane on Earth are biological processes. Termites produce methane, cows produce methane, you and I produce methane, hopefully not quite the high quantities of the cows. But, um, it, you know, but most of the methane in our atmosphere is, is from, you know, uh, biology. And same with oxygen. Oxygen is, is, a, is, is something that um, tends to, by virtue of its, uh, uh, the way that it reacts with things, it likes to bind with stuff. Um, so oxygen, this is, this is why on Mars, you look at all that, uh, you know, the, the red coloring on Mars, you're basically, you're, you're looking at the, the oxygen binding with the iron and, and, and it's becoming, you know, rust effectively. So, yeah. uh, so oxygen doesn't like to hang around. And especially when you've got a very, very, uh, very thin atmosphere, very low atmospheric pressure, um, oxygen tends to sort of just seep out into space if it's if it's not being held there. So it means if you detect it, something's got to be producing it. Um, and when I say producing, it could also just be releasing it because there's very there's certainly a chance that there's some process that we just haven't thought of yet or can't easily um, you know see within the environment of Gale Crater occurring. There are ways that um, geothermal processes can can release oxygen and methane. Um, what is interesting, though, is that the detections appear to have a seasonal relationship. So they appear at certain times of the year and then disappear at other times of the year. And again, that's tantalizing because that could, because we're talking about it's kind of summer and spring periods when, when these, these little flare-ups of, of oxygen that kind of makes you think, well, could there be some photosynthesis occurring at those times? Because it's in winter that it dissipates. So, I mean, that would just be, that would be incredible. So they also took pains to point out that um, because it doesn't last very long, and so too with the, with the methane, um, for Curiosity to, to be able to detect it, it must have detected it very soon after it was either created or emitted or whatever. So that means that the source is tantalizingly close to curiosity, which is also really cool. So, yeah, it's one of those things that, you know, we, we, want, we want to find these things because they're markers. Mm. It doesn't mean anything yet. It doesn't mean that there's definitely biology on Mars, not by a long shot. There's so many things that we need to investigate and rule out first. And unfortunately, we don't necessarily have what we need there right now to do that. Um, but it's just another incremental step. And let's be frank. I mean, I, I, if everything that I've read, um, and it seems that many planetary scientists, uh, you know, seem to think this way, it seems so unlikely that life in some form didn't get started on Mars at some point. It seems unlikely that it, that it didn't happen because it had, it's, it, we know that it has all of the ingredients of life. It has all of the pieces of the puzzle already. It had a rich atmosphere. It had oceans. It had lakes. It had rivers. It had volcanism. It had lightning storms. It had all of the things that we know and we believe were involved in the in the genesis of life here on Earth. And it had it a lot earlier than Earth did. Earth was still a fiery hellhole when, when Mars was in that uh, situation. So... Um, you know, it seems it seems likely that there would have been something there at, at some point in time, but of course that's the holy grail, isn't it? We we don't know yet, but yeah, very cool. Just another another tick, another set of boxes with ticks in it that we need to see. Yeah, it's something to yeah, keep following up on, and I know there's other probes that are going to be looking. And um, I think the uh, European Space Agency is sending a uh, probe that's going to analyze the atmosphere for traces of oxygen and other gases. So. Yes, 
Um, be very interesting to see what happens. Yes, exactly. And uh, you know, uh, and this is, uh, I, I guess it's it's uh, it can be frustrating in in times of, you know, economic uh, austerity to that that Mars does get so much of the, you know, the budget really. You know, it, particularly when we're talking about NASA mm-hmm. uh, and JPL, that, and Mars does get a lot of attention, and a lot of the investment is in, you know, looking for for you know, conditions on Mars and life on Mars and so forth. But let's face it, it's it's easier. You know, it's it's closer. It's easier for us to investigate and it's more hospitable. Um, you know, if we look at, for example, uh, the, the the next story that we're about to cover, which is Europa, um, we might as well do that right now. So Europa, uh, what, if you remember the Galileo mission, which which uh, did its its you know, flybys of Jupiter back in the late nineties, the Galileo spacecraft. Uh, one of the things that it showed us was that Jupiter's magnetic field was misbehaving. It wasn't. It, it seemed to be. Ha- it seemed to have something that was in, that was interacting with it. Now Jupiter has a massive magnetic field. It is ridiculously huge. If you see. Uh, you can actually look for maps of this where it shows you Jupiter in the sky, picture, you know, a, 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 you know like a, uh, like a, a pin, a, uh, a pinhead in the sky and its magnetic field then extending away from it. It's mind blowingly huge uh, in terms of the, the amount of uh, sky that, that it, it, it would cover from here. Um, so Jupiter has this, this intense, intense uh, magnetic field. Um, so even in the 90s with Galileo, they were able to detect um, and map out to some degree the, the magnetic field of, of Jupiter. And they found that, as I say, there was something that was messing with it. And uh, they had various theories as to what this could be, various hypotheses. And one of these was that perhaps Europa might have um, an elect- electrically conductive fluid, like <laughs> salt water, um, you know, which could be causing these disturbances. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. Uh, it was, it was a, you know, it was an extension of what we could see. This is when we got our, our very first very um, close-ups of, of Europa, and we saw the the features on its surface, which look very much like, you know, the the ripples and cracks that appear in uh, surface ice on Earth. So it was a tantalising sort of hint that there would be potentially oceans under this ice surface of Europa and if they were salty oceans briny sort of oceans this further indicates that for the oceans to be uh, liquid under the ice considering this is very cold then something has to be maintaining that now it could be just the gravitational influence of, of Jupiter, of course, it's it's it has a lot of influence on its moons, and there could be like a flexing sort of thing going on with with Europa, which could be, you know, if you imagine sort of uh, squishing a um, a ball a, a ball of frozen uh, uh, what were those what were those icy poles that like the Sunny Boys? Remember the Sunny Boys? If you, you get oh, yeah. this kind of this sort of uh, uh, triangular. That were the pyramid ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So with with like a giant samosa. Right. Yeah. Exactly. That's exactly <laughs> right. That's the shape. So um, you know, if you, if you if you were to flex that uh, under great pressure for a long period of time, what would happen is it would start to melt on the inside because of that flexing. And th- this is one possibility of what could be causing the uh, if there is in, in, indeed a, a liquid ocean under the ice of Europe, but this this could be the 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 way that the liquid stays liquid. But another possibility, of course, is geothermal vents. So if there are um, geological processes on Europa, if it does have some sort of rocky core, then that could be warming the oceans. And, of course, as we see here on Earth, geothermal vents are actually a prime place for life to uh, be clustered because there's an energy source there. So uh, until now, uh, we haven't really been able to do all that much with this uh, observations. But recently, back in 2016, some scientists, some earthbound scientists using the Hubble Space Telescope, um, they detected some water plumes erupting from Europa's surface. Now, that was cool in and of itself, but what they wanted to then do was to figure out 
were these plumes, do, can we use these plumes to give us some indication of what could be causing them? So, for example, and this I'm going to read directly from this story here just to, to put it in context. If they detected water vapour, um, they'd have to contend with two leading theories for how it got there. The first theory is that either a subsurface global ocean or pockets of liquid water in Europa's crust ejected it into the atmosphere. The other is that charged particles from Jupiter are bombarding the moon and turning the water ice on the surface into water vapor. Now, oh, wow. so, so they can, what they realized was that if it was the latter of those two things, if it was charged particles coming from Jupiter, then they should see a fairly consistent um, number of water plumes. They, sh they should be pretty much all the time because these charged particles are coming from Jupiter pretty much all the time. There would be some variation in terms of which part of the moon is facing where and stuff like that and, and you mm. know, how thick is the ice or whatever, but, but you would expect to see it fairly consistently. However, they didn't. They, in fact, saw very few events. Um, they only detected water vapour once during two and a half weeks of the observation, but there was a lot of it. And they said here that the water vapour that came out of the atmosphere would have filled an Olympic-sized swimming pool in just minutes. So it was a sudden wow. outgassing of, uh, uh, of, of water uh, at this time. Um, so that is actually indicative that the process is internal. And that's, again, really tantalising. That, that's what we want. Mm. That's, that, that's an indication that there could, in fact, be something within... Like a subsurface lake or something, that, that, or ocean. Yes, that definitely, but also that uh, a process within is what's heating it up, which is very cool because that that's you know an indication of an energy source there that could be used, it could be harnessed by life if it existed there. So that's why that's interesting because uh, yep, there was there was vapor. That's cool, but the the way that the vapor manifested gives us certain information, yeah. which is awesome. I love this stuff. I love the detective, you know, sort of piecing <laughs> it's the all this. Yeah. It is, yeah, it's piecing all this stuff together. So, so that's what happened over in Europa. Very cool. So, and and I guess that brings us to the to the final story, which was uh, was actually a, a reflection, if you like, Opinion on the piece. Scientific yeah. American blogs, uh, and it's titled, which which almost, to be honest, I almost didn't read it because of the title, because it sounded, you know, uh -huh. meh, vague and boring. It said, it said, when we finally find aliens. They might smell terrible. And I thought, okay, whatever. But it did make some very interesting points. Um, one of which is is our fascination with looking for oxygen is predicated on our understanding of life, advanced complex life on Earth. Uh, mm -hmm. We we have an oxygen based biology. We 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 need oxygen as a to to survive. But that wasn't always the case. In fact, for almost half the the Earth's you know, span of existence, um, the life forms on Earth did not want oxygen. In fact, it was toxic to them. Um, so it wasn't really until wasn't until the stromatolites came along, basically, that we um, that we had life forms that were kind of um, pumping out oxygen. And once once that happened, it, it allowed other other biology to evolve. Prior to that, it was it was um, very very rich in carbon dioxide, and and it was not not a a place that we would recognise and survive in. So it certainly begs the question, what if um, that kind of biology never got started on other, on other planets, other exoplanets, um, what kind of advanced life could exist on those? And could, could the life on those ones basically, could we bypass them in our search because we're so, you know, dialled into looking for oxygen that we wouldn't think of looking, for example, for phosphine, which to us would be toxic, but to early life on Earth, phosphine was their thing. That was their oxygen. Um, so that was very interesting when you consider, you know, these other planetary science things sort of showing, you know, we've, we've detected this here and that over here, and these are things that we're really interested in because it's an indicator of life as we know it. But, of course, there's always that back of the, the mind thing of it's not just life as we know it. It's we have to consider possibilities in biology the, the things that could exist we just just because we haven't seen them recently doesn't mean they're not out there but are, are we not taking that into account like i mean every not really. time we find an exoplanet we try and look at its spectra and we try and analyze what the atmosphere are, is wouldn't we detect if there's phosphine and someone go hang on that's odd 
Well, we have to be we have to make a decision to look for it, right? So at the moment, um, at the moment with our with, we're not at the point yet that we can really uh, easily detect methane and and uh, and oxygen uh, unless we have a planetary body that has a vast atmosphere and we're getting enough light going through the atmosphere and, and coming to us so that we mm. can break it out apart with, with spectral analysis. But we will get there. There's no doubt about that. Um, but the thing is we have to be open to looking for these other things and not just looking for them, also recognising that there are other molecules that exist that could potentially fuel life. And we've, you know, we've covered off things in the past. Do you remember that, that NASA press release about um, silicon-based life a few years ago? I, I think we covered it on the, on the um, story. It was, it was an example of how not to do press releases in terms of they kind of excited the entire world that they had found silicon-based life. Do you mean life. the arsenic one? Oh, was it arsenic? The yeah, arsenic yeah. one? Yeah. yeah. Um, can survive in high arsenic based environments or something right yeah. yeah so so these are the things that that in terms of um, exobiologists who who you know are involved with 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 theorizing what are the conditions that that biology could exist elsewhere and also how could we look for it it's just a lot broader than we kind of are automatically conditioned to to think of that mm. we should look for I guess also uh, when it comes to analyzing the spectra and everything, like you actually need to know what sort of molecular fingerprint phosphine or yes. one of these other rare gases is actually going to have on light. And to do that, you probably need a lot of computing power. Yes. You'd need, I don't know, maybe like synchrotron radiation or something to uh, analyze this sort of stuff. Yes. Obviously, Dr. Helen Maynard Casely would know better than I do. But you actually need to have a baseline of what you're looking for in these exoplanets or even planets in our solar system yes. to find those trace uh, signatures but yes and and there's a, there is a good part in this this art, this this blog piece where the author talks about we only have spectra of about 4% of all possible biosignature gases so we only know what to oh, look wow. for for about 4% so it's not just um, can we detect it we haven't even full. We haven't even actually collected spectra to know what it looks like for for the vast majority right. of the potential gases. Yeah, and they'd be the four percent, the big four, or here on Earth sort of thing. Yeah, and not big four on another planet sort of thing. Yes. Wow. So they, they said getting spectra for phosphine alone took them four years to to get that spectra, so that they then know what the baseline is, what to look for for to to see uh, phosphine in a, in a spectra. So, yeah, it's it's a challenge. Four years, wow. Mm. But that's why it's good to have these sorts of articles and to raise this issue and hopefully other scientists will read that, will think about it and um, we'll start looking in that direction. So full credit to Clara Sousa Silva, the uh, molecular astrophysicist who wrote that uh, blog for Scientific American. Yes, and despite Let's the hope- title, I'm glad I read it. <laughs> See, can't judge a you- blog post by its <laughs> title. <laughs> to update an aphorism. <laughs> uh, well, speaking of strange life, Penny, let's talk about snakes and how recently uh, paleontologists in Argentina excavated a number of nearly 100 million year old snake fossils. But the interesting thing. Thing is that these snakes had hind legs not front legs just hind legs they were like really long lizards without front legs or something it's i have <laughs> just like gone into a snake and lizard evolution hole um since <laughs> <laughs> well, i never even thought about why snakes don't have legs like i never thought did they have legs and then they de-evolved them or did they just never evolve legs at all obviously this would suggest they had them originally and then lost them it it? does it does ed tangent have you heard of legless lizards which are not snakes i have yeah i've heard of them i don't know anything about them but i've heard (laughs) of them (laughs) so apparently and to any like i think the word is herpetologist listening apologies for my like Mm -hmm. guess what guys the sky is blue it's dark at night (laughs) like (laughs) Legs or no legs is not really the defining difference between a snake and a lizard. Who would have thought? There's a lot of things that make snakes snakes and legs are not one of them because I'm like, what? Snakes with legs? But 
Snakes are snakes. Snakes don't That's have legs. True. I mean, is an eel a snake or is a worm a snake? Because they also don't have legs. I don't no, know. No. So just speculating here. So in um, <laughs> no, they're good questions. But snakes and lizards are quite closely related. They have a common ancestor far more common than they would have with an eel or a worm. So the shape of an eel or worm is more like convergent evolution where the same shape evolves in different evolutionary lineages but for the same reasons or the similar environmental pressures. But snakes and lizards are bona fide cousins. So they they share a common ancestor but they're not super close necessarily. And in fact, snakes, if you think about this whole clade or group of organisms of snakes and lizards um, snakes are like one big group of legless lizards in a way they've all got a common ancestor they split off first and then the what we call the lizards split off afterwards and then there's some other kinds of lizards that have also evolved leglessness as well as a whole bunch of legged lizards so what this made me think about is, A, this fossil find shows that snakes um, had hind legs for millions of years. So after they diverged from the main lizard lineage, they still kept their hind legs for ages. But there's lots of ways we can tell if something is a snake or a lizard, regardless of whether or not it has legs. So bear with me. Most lizards have legs. Modern snakes do not have legs, but obviously these ancient snakes did. But some of the other things is to do with the skull and the head. So lizards have external ears, but snakes don't. They can only hear through the skull bone. Um, So they hear through vibrations of their skull bone, not ears like we have. Snakes can't close their eyes. Um, Snakes only have one working lung. Who knew that? I didn't know that. So I did not. So lizards have two lungs. Snakes only have one. And obviously, well, not obviously, but snakes have much more flexible jaws. So we've seen snakes open up Mm -hmm. their jaws really wide. So we can tell this fossil is a snake because of its other features in its skull and anatomy. So, and the way it was studied was using microcomputed tomography scanning, which allows fossils to be studied without damaging them. So this is a step back for our understanding of... Uh A step. A step back forward. Sorry. It's like a step back in time for our understanding of snakes. We haven't found yet a fossil of a four-legged snake ancestor, which is weird, but there would have been an ancestor of snakes that had four legs. But what this new So, fossil, hang on. Yeah. Do, do we actually know that? Like, can we look at a snake skeleton and go, ah, that is a vestigial front leg or something? Or... Did we? Did they maybe, were they always bipedal and they never had front legs or we're assuming they did? Well, we actually know that all of the vertebrates, so, or no, sorry, all of the, the tetrapods, um, so all the amphibians, fish, birds, mammals, we all, we, we all developed or evolved from common ancestors which had four legs. Okay. And right. genetic studies, even though we haven't necessarily got fossils of the four legs, we know that the ancestors way, way back had four legs. So when I say we haven't found an ancestor of a snake with four legs, what we haven't found is an ancestor of a snake with four legs that is not also the ancestor of a whole bunch of other stuff. So we're looking for when that snake lineage kind of evolved. If you imagine a branching tree and you can think of the snakes as, you know, one strong branch with a whole bunch of twigs coming off, all the different kinds of snakes We're looking for that strong branch, which we haven't found yet. But what we have found is that back legs in snakes did stick around for a long time. So snakes probably lost their forelimbs about 170 million years ago. But um, Forelimbs as in the front front two limbs. limbs. Yes, sorry. It sounds like you're saying all four limbs. No, no, sorry. (laughs) Four, like F-O-R-E. This fossil is um, 100 million years old. So it suggests that for 70 million years or so, snakes just had their hind legs. And if you have a look at the artist's impression of what it might have looked like, it's pretty trippy. So it's this snake but with little tiny little legs way up the back, which (laughs) would not really be functional for anything much. It still moves by slithering and so on. 
So it will be fascinating to understand um, the lifestyle of these organisms, hmm. how they lived, what was happening, what evolutionary well, pressures were working on them yeah. to give them this anatomy. It's fascinating. Just yeah, and to, to your your point before about vestigial legs as well as um, boa constrictors and uh, pythons, I think have, have got these vestigial leg uh, features in there, mm. which are visible on their skeletons, but also they've got like muscle formations around where these sort of leg bones are um, from back in the day when they had the when they had legs. Mm. Which is, and they're not the only group of animals that have that. Um, whales actually, who you know, are renowned for not having legs, they have vestigial <laughs> pelvic girdle. So they have some little vestigial bones that are analogous to, you know, the pelvis, which is so important for humans and other uh, mammals and tetrapods for our legs to attach to. So even though they've in evolutionary time have lost their legs, they've still got that little pelvis there, which the only reason, well not the only evolutionary use for it was to attach leg bones to, really. Why, why would you be a creationist? <laughs> I know. It is so freaky it's, cool. It's so cool. <laughs> it's funny you said that because when I searched oh. for uh, vestigial leg snakes, a whole lot of the first page was creationists debunking things on, uh, on uh. vestigial legs in snakes. It's not true. They're, they're actually this. And yeah, no, they're not. Mm. Okay. Nice try. <laughs> wow. That's awesome. And I think that's our show. As always, all the links that we talked about are in the show notes and on the web at scienceontop.com slash 347. And don't forget to let us know your top stories of 2019 and sign up to Patreon to help us out financially. Scienceontop.com is where to go for all of that. Thanks, Penny and Lucas. Thanks, Ed. Thanks, Ed. And thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll be back again next week, putting science on top of the agenda. Join us then. One of the very this is this is my favourite story of the day, right? So in Russia, they're trying to convince cows that it's summer all year round to help with milk production. Right. So what they've done is they've put virtual reality headsets on cows. Oh no! To convince them that it's summer. Oh, there is a. It's the world's smallest picture, right? But hold on a second. Can I put my glasses wanna, on for it? Do you want to? Let's have a look. Can you get? Can you get in there? Look. There, no there is. There is a way. cow with a virtual reality headset on. Right. Um, so the TV. cow's mood was improved, officials say, and they expect the calm conditions to elevate milk quality and quantity. The only thing I can say that is poor cow. Yes. Well, <laughs> unless unless the cow is convinced happy. this is lovely. <laughs> it's it's summer all year. You need to have the smells really of summer as well, don't you? It's just watching a film. That's what it is.